was natural and that Aborigines had very little impact on it. What I'm arguing is that Aborigines deliberately shaped the vegetation. They did that with fire or with no fire. Both of them equally important, so you have grass and dense forests. And they placed those very carefully, uh, firstly to control fuel, uh, secondly to uh, make sure that every species had a habitat that suited it, with plants or animals, insects and so on. And uh, thirdly, to make all their resources uh, convenient. And that meant a very skillful distribution of different plant communities over the landscape and a collaboration with their neighbours, of course. You couldn't have somebody working so hard in one area and the person next door not doing anything. And it's for that reason that a collaboration between neighbours that I think of Australia as a single estate and therefore the biggest estate on earth. One of the things that interested me in reading this book was the way in which you placed yourself right in the middle of an argument that has usually been had about bodies, which is about whether we're made by nature or culture. Hmm. And now you're saying, hang on, we have to apply that argument to the landscape, that it's not formed by nature, that in fact Australia has always been made by people. Is this contentious? I mean, have you had to argue with scientists? Uh, first of all, let me say that I wasn't the first to come up with that. Um, people like Rhys Jones and Duncan Merrilies and Sylvia Hattam for South West Australia, Bill Jackson in Tasmania, all suggested uh, some aspects of the idea that uh, Aborigines were influencing the landscape. But yes, I have uh, had a few run-ins with scientists. Uh, usually, what, what would happen after a, a talk, and perhaps it'll happen tonight, is that uh, a scientist will come up, being very helpful, very condescending, and say, uh, now, where you've gone wrong, Bill, <laughs> and trot out X, Y, and Z, and that's one of the reasons why I've been a bit forthright about scientists towards the end of the book. On the other hand, there are some scientists who say, thank heavens, somebody's taking on that clique, it's about time people realise that 1798 is not just a virgin landscape, that it was actually made. Well, can you talk a bit more then about those documents, the words from First Contact that made you go, hang on, there's something going on here. What types of descriptions? What, mm. what is it that people were saying? Well, if I can dodge the documents for a, a fraction of a second, because there's really two Im influences. One is looking at the landscape, and one is going to the archives as a result, and then going back to the landscape. And really, in my case, it was the landscape that was first. I suppose, uh, uh, like a lot of farmers, I, I uh, absorbed their way of looking at country in terms of the trees. This is in the Riverina where I come from. And, and as any farmer there will tell you, um, if you see river red gum, you're on alluvial soils and that's not especially good for crops. Uh, if you see uh, yellow box, that's a, a loamy soil and that means it's very good for growing crops and so on because it's very easy to plough, especially for pioneers with using horses and so on. But then I realised that in some places where there weren't actual farms, it was in hilly country or uh, stock reserves and so on, what trees ought to be there weren't there. And so I puzzled about that. And then uh, I read in the records things that confirm that. For example, uh, one I remember most distinctly was an old drover who was reminiscencing about the Riverina where I come from. Uh, and he was reminiscing about 1870, I think it was, talking about the late 40s, 1840s, 1850s. And he said the river banks were a pastoral paradise. The grasses were lush, there's an open panorama. Now those river banks now are river red gum forest. And they've been, every flood drops a whole lot of seedlings of river red gum. And you can see the tears, that's the 1916 flood, the 1934 flood, 1974 flood and so on. Um, so the obvious question was, if river red gum was dropping all those seedlings 
in those floods, why wasn't it doing it before Europeans? Why was he describing it as grass? And that confirmed the same question I had at looking at the distribution of trees. And so it went back and forth like that. For years it went back and forth. And it took me a while to think uh, Aborigines were the chief in influence because usually the first thing you think of is um, shallow soil, that is, might have rocks underneath it, or salt, or the aspect, or something like that, or regular flooding or swamping. None of those fitted, so it led to Aborigines. Well, and that's a theme that comes through the whole book, that it becomes a story of looking at the absences mm -hmm. and looking at these absent trees, that in a way they're, they're the things that are, that's animating the book. Exactly. Seeing what's not there is really crucial. And one of my key questions was to look at sources, written and painting, and see uh, open grassland, go to the same spot, thick trees. The obvious question, if trees grow there now, why not then? Well, let's talk about those paintings then, because, again, one of the old arguments has been that there are these very early colonial paintings and they look like rolling grasslands. And one of the arguments has been that this is a European way of looking at a landscape and of understanding a vista. Mm -hmm. And so you looked at these paintings and you saw something else. Yeah, well, the obvious thing to do before you assume that it's a, a European romantic landscape is to go to where the painting was painted and see if it's accurate or not. And, and in some cases, uh, the actual rocks in the foreground are the same. You can find the same rocks. Not always. Um, and in some cases, that, that even denies the, the title of the painting. Uh, Eugène von Gerard painted a direct northeast view, I think it is, from Mount Kosciuszko. When you go there, it's clear it's Mount Townsend because the rocks are very distinctive and they're lying on each other and so on. In other words, very precise detail over, I don't know, 50 to 100 rocks. You quite clearly are in the right place and the caption quite clearly is wrong for reasons I could explain. And that, that happened time and time again. I remember having a, one, a, one of Joseph Lysett's paintings and edging across this paddock and uh, just comparing the, the painting with the angles of the, uh, the peninsulas and the lake in front of me and stepping onto an old convict road which was hidden in the paddock but all these broken stones and that was depicted in the front of Lysett's painting, a, a road built in 1820. It's very convincing that you happen to be <laughs> in the right place. And then when you find you're in the right place, you then look at the trees. And, of course, quite often uh, there's much more grass uh, in the paintings than there is now. You can see that upstairs in the Grass Kings. There are, there are drawings there, even though they're a little bit later than the first arrivals, where there's great swathes of open grassland. And yet trees grow there now. Why not then? You also make an argument about the colour. So the, again, these very early paintings, they're, they're lush and they're green. They're not the same colours that we have come to associate with our sense of the Australian landscape. So they're different grasses, they're different pastures. Mm. Of course, there are a great number of uh, native grasses in Australia, uh, but to simplify, I, I take one of the most common, and that's kangaroo grass. It's called kangaroo grass pretty well all over Australia, sometimes oat grass. It uh, had the great advantage, it has disadvantages for stock, it has a spiral seed which can pierce a bullock hide. Um, but it has the great advantage that it seeds in late summer and it's green over some of the bottom tufts are green. And that means firstly it's shielding water in the hottest part of the year and secondly there's green feed there for grazing animals. Um, and when it headed, when it grew seeds, um, they were a dark tan colour, a very rich tan, and the healthier the plant, the richer the tan. What uh, Europeans brought in was either grasses that uh, were like clover and so on, which don't do anything in particular in summer unless they're watered, or the crops, 
and the crops are a, a dead white or a dead cream. You can see it in wild oats and oats and wheat, barley and so on, which meant that the dominant colour of Australia, especially on the inland plains, changed from this rich, dark tan to a, a dead cream white and from uh, shielding drought protecting grasses to drought to dead grasses which of course allows drought to take hold. And there's a, a, a line that I, I really enjoyed in the book where you say kangaroo grass deserves a statue. It deserves a statue, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I was talking recently with some mountain cattlemen up in Gippsland and uh, one of them who hadn't read the book, it was part of the way through, it came up holding some kangaroo grass. And he said, this is what made Australia. And I think he's right. That was the grass that made it possible for Australia to live on the sheep's back. And of course, the sheep have got to live on grass and the grass has got to be put there in the first place. How do you find Aboriginal voices in this story? How do you find their understanding of the land or, and of that management of the land that you're making a case for? I, I uh, didn't speak to many Aboriginal people. I spoke to Aboriginal friends, uh, but they're, they are not many. But uh, it's a book that covers the whole of Australia and Tasmania, and I didn't feel able to wander up to Aboriginal people that I didn't know and say, right, oh, you've got 20 minutes, give us your basic secrets and I'll be out of here. <laughs> you can't do it. just can't do it. So the Aboriginal voice comes in their impact on the land. As I say, in, in seeing, for example, um, plants that are fire sensitive right next door to plants that need fire to flourish. And you say, how do they do that? And quite often the question, how do they do that, come, comes to mind. And that led me very gradually, I must admit, to be impressed with Aboriginal achievement. And, uh, to be quite frank, a lot of it I still don't know how they actually did it. All I know is that they did. Well, tell us more, though, about what it was for, the, particularly the use of fire. Um, because, it, I mean, one of the presumptions about the use of fire on landscapes has been about hunting, but it's not as simple as that, is it? No, it's definitely not. And in fact, hunting is, uh, is comes second to fire. Uh, you don't uh, burn to hunt. Uh, you hunt when you, you happen to be, when you are burning at the right time. Uh, I, I imagine a sequence. I don't have clear evidence of this, but I imagine a sequence. But being a historian, you don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. And that Anybody is, who can make a whole history out of watching grass grow. I think yeah. You <laughs> <laughs> All you've got to do is check that nobody else is interested in that and you can say what you like. <laughs> but if you imagine that uh, Aboriginal people confront the problem of how to deal with fire, I mean, you think of the terrible fires we've had around virtually every capital city in the last few decades, one or another, uh, and how they've destroyed 500 houses in Canberra and the terrible fires of 2009 around Melbourne and so on. Aboriginal people couldn't have got away from those fires. They couldn't have outrun them. They couldn't have evaded them. And it follows that at the very least, they reduced such fires. I think almost entirely prevented them. So. One of their major tasks is to control fuel, okay, to reduce fuel. And they do that by burning scrub and providing big fire breaks of grassland. When, when they become skilled at that, they can see they can do fire with other things. I mean, the most obvious thing is that they can uh, protect where they live and then they protect where animals live uh, from fires that are too hot. Once you start protecting animals, you say, OK, well, what do they need? Uh, kangaroos, for example, want grass, good, rich grass to eat, and forest, forest to shelter in. So you put the grass next to the forest 
Not too dense, because that'll slow kangaroos down. Not too open, because uh, then it's not safe shelter for them. The right uh, degree of openness, if I could put it away, that way, next to the grass. And when you do that, then you've got to do the same thing for all the other animals and plants and insects and reptiles. And of course, then you can also make use of that yourself. That open forest becomes a place from which you can hunt kangaroos. Yeah. Well, and again, some of the ways in which you've traced this was mm. by descriptions of, for example, Cook looking at the landscape and saying there was no underbrush. Mm. And um, Banks describing the landscape in particular mm. ways. Mm. It's extraordinary the number of uh, people who say no underwood or no underbrush or no scrub. Um, that seems to be a very common feature. And of course, that's what generates a park. One of the understandings of park is big, tall, attractive trees and grass underneath. So you get an open vista all the way through. And Europeans are often describing that landscape, including in places where now the scrub is very thick, very dense, and you couldn't run a rat to the square mile in it. Uh, so, yes, that, that's a, a good example of a, a made landscape. And you can see how that might start with the need to control fuel. Because scrub is the lethal layer in fire. I don't mean to say that it's as uh, intense as a canopy fire that sets a light to the top of gum trees, but it's what lifts the flames from the ground into the canopies of the trees. If there's no scrub layer and you've got small enough fires along the grass, then you've got a, a much better chance of controlling fire, whether it's deliberate or accidental. So you can see why Aboriginal people were interested in parks for self-preservation and then they see its advantage for, first of all, plants that like that open forest country and then uh, reptiles, snakes, for example, and then uh, animals like koalas and possums and so on. But you also point out that th there are many other reasons why um, Aboriginal people might want these clearings and spaces. And one of them, one good example, is, is right here, isn't it, where, where we are in um, the cultural precinct of, of Brisbane. So an area like this, what was going on here? Uh, you're, you're referring to my inference that this was a cultural centre <laughs> before Europeans arrived as well as afterwards. Yeah, there's some really quite striking plant distributions which are, are traced in the first uh, surveyors surveys of this area. Uh, surveyors in those days uh, had the knack of describing the vegetation um, and so they draw on their maps what was trees and what was grassy plains and uh, they were told to do that. That was an instruction. People were looking for grass 70 years before they were looking for gold. Grass is what mattered. And along here you can see, for example, down the reach past uh, South Bank, a belt of uh, rainforest, narrow belt, only 100 metres or so wide, which suddenly becomes grassland. And then back around this curve, if I could put it that way, you see these clearings. And they look very much like uh, ceremonial cent centres. And there are references to Aboriginal ceremonial centres in this area. So I, I think, first of all, this is an area which both men and women could go to. And secondly, it was for cultural purposes. Can't prove it, but I think so. Well, and you've got other interesting examples of that, in including other Queensland examples, like in the Bunya Mountains, mm. a place that was well known as a, a meeting place. Mm. And again, I think there are, um, there are clearings there too, aren't there? Yes, that's right. And uh, one of the advantages of looking at the whole of Australia, I don't have to go through the disadvantages, but... Uh, <laughs> One of the advantages was you'd see that pattern of um, grassy slopes surrounded by rainforest and now eucalypts recapturing that grassland, invading it from the edges. And that's a pattern you can see everywhere. Uh, Queensland, Western Australia, the Kimberleys, Tasmania. And uh, that recapturing by trees on such a wide scale is in itself quite clear evidence that something was stopping it from happening before Europeans arrived. Which complicates the idea of returning Australia to some um, 
idolised wilderness. Yeah, very difficult to return it to that, although wilderness is something Europeans invented. Um, very difficult indeed because you've got so many species. I mean, we've been watching Camp for Laurels for the last few days. Um, on the other hand, uh, the alternative is to have more killer fires, more Melbourne 2009. However difficult it is to control fuel, it seems to me a better option to try that than to suffer the, the periodic fires that our capital cities have gone through. I mean, even in other parts of Australia now, such fires are burning. We happen to be saved here at the moment because uh, rain is building up the fuel for the next fire. And I want to get on to the, the sort of nature of, of fire in a moment, but just to, to stick with the sort of the, the evidence, the detail that you're finding, um, one of the things that um, interested me was the way in which, in English place names at least, Australia isn't known for its fanciful or whimsical place names. So if something's called Flat Rock Beach, there's probably a flat rock there, mm. you know, Boulder Beach. And yet there are all these places called Grassy Hill, One Tree Hill, mm. Bald Hill. And you looked at these places, didn't you? And what, what did you find? Yeah. Sometimes I found uh, natural reasons as to why they're bald. And one of the ones I mentioned, uh, shallow soil over rock is quite common on the tops of hill because the soil is leached away. But more often, I found that a lot of those hills are no longer bald. I give only one example, I think, in the book, and that's Captain Cook's description of Grassy Hill uh, up at Cooktown. It's not grassy now, it's covered in trees, and yet he described it as with a few scattered trees on it. And he, named, he was the one who named it Grassy Hill. And that, you can find that again all over Australia. So it strikes me though that this argument complicates our sense of our history at sort of all ends of a, a settler history, but in particular it challenges that, that idea, which I guess was the basis for a lot of colonial encounters, which was a presumption that Aboriginal people weren't doing anything. Yes, it does challenge it and it turns it on, on its head. Um, there's a quote from the Sydney Herald, the predecessor of the Sydney Morning Herald, and it says something like, uh, the Aborigines uh, treat the land much like the emu and the kangaroo. Who in his right mind would think that the creator ever intended such a rich country to be left as an abandoned wilderness? Uh, in other words, it's the duty of white people to colonise it and, and so on. So it's, it almost contributes to the terra nullius idea. Yes, it's, uh, terra, terra nullius wasn't a word actually used in, but it's a good summation of, uh, of what Europeans thought. But of course what happens now is uh, we have national parks which actually are left alone. And you can see, you, you go into a lot of national parks and you'll see a few big trees and a whole lot of regeneration. Not only in national parks, but that's an easy place to go. In other words, we have made it wilderness. We are no longer managing it in the same way as the Aboriginal people. And on the argument of the Sydney Herald, perhaps therefore we ought to give it back. <laughs> well, there's some terribly poignant stories in the book, mm. particularly from Tasmania, um, at a time when Aboriginal people were being pursued and they made themselves visible by continuing mm. to work the land with fire. Yeah, yes, I, I found that terribly poignant too. Um, it's not clear how many Aborigines were in Australia, in Tasmania when Europeans arrived, uh, but they were certainly down to a fraction by the time of the incident you refer to, which is about 1830. Then, in the northeast of Tasmania, there are about 70 people left, split into small bands, and they're being hunted down by bounty hunters and so on. And the great conciliator, as he's called, George Augustus Robinson, was looking for the most important leader. And it, for months, he couldn't find him. And then suddenly, uh, there were these fires, 
And he just, he and his, the Aborigines with him just followed these fires and they came upon this leader and a small group of other people. Now that man, Man and Manalagena knew that the whites were looking for him. He knew Robinson was looking for him, although he didn't know why and didn't know how lethal he might be. But still, he was burning the bush to maintain it as he was supposed to do. That's a brave man. Is this a new form of labour history then? Is it, a, is it a way of looking at Aboriginal people and work? Well, yeah, Australia, Australia, a lot of Australian traditions about work, aren't they? A lot of our songs, Click Go the Shears and Man from Snowy River and so on, they're about work. Uh, and if we understand that uh, Australia was made in 1788, uh, then there's a lot of research to be done on work uh, in Aboriginal times, absolutely. Who and did it and what specialisms and so on. And you make arguments in the book. That there are two sort of concepts that you use that I think are important in understanding your argument. And one is about mosaics and the other is about templates, mm. which in a way both sound like they could be making quilts. But anyway, can you explain what that means? What are the mosaics that you're talking about? OK, a mosaic is a word that predates me and it's a description of, uh, of how fire, especially cool fire, burns alternate patches. Sorry, what's cool fire? What does that a mean? A cool fire is a fire that has very little fuel to go on and uh, so the flames don't come up very high. There's a man in Victoria in 1840 who described a fire that Aborigines had lit saying you could jump over it. You could easily jump over it. And that's a cool fire. A well-known term now among firefighters and so on. Do firefighters talk to you about the book? Yeah, yeah, they did. Uh, they do. Um, and so what that does is create mosaics of burnt and unburnt land. Even in grassland you can have different mosaics. And of course uh, a bushfire itself will leave patches of unburnt country. Even a very hot fire, the opposite of a cool fire, uh, leaves small patches of unburnt country under the lee of a hill, for example. If a fire comes up over a hill, it curls round and, and quite often in that curling part there's a bit left unburnt. So they're mosaics and Aboriginal people are deliberately creating those, for example, for the reason I gave earlier, that kangaroos want trees on one end and grass on, on the other. Uh, a template is, is not an ideal word but basically, I use it to describe country that is made as a template. It's, it's laid out for future use. Um, you can well imagine if you, if you want to uh, put uh, Aborigines on grass, uh, sorry, kangaroos on grass next to forest, you've got to make the grass beforehand. And you've got to make it the best grass the most luscious grass in the area, otherwise a kangaroos will go somewhere else. So you've got to make it and then you leave it, and that's the template, until it's time to use it. And then you burn a patch of the grass, a fortnight later it comes up green, the kangaroos go into that spot, you then hunt them. So that's a template in use then. So what was it then that, that stopped this? Was it just private ownership? Was it a completely different... Was it just about these practices being disrupted? Yeah, it, they're disrupted in, in various ways. Uh, either Europeans occupied the country and they saw the value of fire. Very early settlers are quite often burning country. Just they don't have the skill. They don't realise that a cool fire is more important than a hot fire. So they did either emulate or learn from? They tried. They did try, yeah. And uh, that tradition continued. Uh, there are many parts, the southwest of Western Australia, for example, where people still burn in that way. Uh, and in the Northern Territory, uh, pastors will also burn because they know the regenerating effects of fire, Western Queensland too. Uh, they just didn't have the skills. So uh, they produce a much more monolithic result. They keep the grass going for cattle, 
but they don't stop the hills getting thickening up with more and more trees and so on. They don't have the diversity of interest. Uh, in other words, uh, even when people attempted to imitate it, those templates were gradually destroyed. And of course, in many places, they didn't attempt to imitate it. And in other places, uh, they killed the Aborigines so that there was nobody there to maintain it. How, how hard is it then to see this as, as a national practice? Well, I, I, I remarked earlier that you've got this very intricate system of land management of putting one plant here and providing a place for koalas or uh, red belly blacks or yam daisy or kangaroo grass or whatever it may be. And that, that requires a lot of balance, a lot of planning, a lot of negotiation. And that's being reinforced by the totems. The totems basically uh, oblige Aboriginal people to look after those of the same totem. So if you're emu totem, you have to look after emus and emu habitat. And emus have to look after you as well. It's a two-way obligation. Uh, and that means that if other people are burning, the emu person is on the lookout to make sure that there's something there for emu habitats. Okay, so you've got this very intricate uh, balance, both ecological and religious, and religious sanction, of course, is extremely powerful in any society. Now, if that operates in one place, it's very hard to imagine a place next door where it wouldn't operate. I mean, first of all, it couldn't operate if, if it was just random outside it. And secondly, we, we know very well that the totems operated across the whole of Australia and Tasmania. So it was having this impact in one place, same religion has the same impact on other places. Is this a romantic history? Oh, I'm not into romance. <laughs> <laughs> And in fact, I'm not sure what it means, you know. Uh, people talk about romantic paintings and then they talk about Wordsworth and daffodils and that. I, I've got nothing against daffodils, but I, I, don't, it's, I don't think of it in that way. I think of it in some ways a, a, a poetic history because of how neatly things seem to tie together. The more I learnt, the more things dovetailed in. I might not understand why, or more exactly how, but they did. And then I thought, oh, this is really neat. Well, I must say, one of the things that your book has done has made me want to go back and look at all sorts of sources again, and even things like painting. So the Frederick McCubbin painting, which is so familiar, you know, that painting, Down on His Luck, I had never noticed that there was a fire-scarred tree in that painting mm. until you described it. And mm. so I just am wondering how many other clues and cues I've missed from this. Yes, that's the painting with one big stringy bark on one side and then a whole lot of little trees regrowing. And a whole lot of saplings or even they're more seedlings in the front, aren't they? Yeah, well, the obvious question about that painting is why is there only one big tree? If there's all these hundreds of uh, saplings, in the front, where are the big trees? We're talking about a time before it's been cleared for farming. The other thing that this, that this history is or makes us think about, I think, though, is a history of fear. Because for many of us, fire is something, mm -hmm. you know, it, it can be hearth and home and, and comforting, but it's also something that we're afraid of. Yes, fire in the bush is, is something we fear. Whereas for Aborigines, it was an ally. It was a totem, first of all. That meant there were people who were specialists in fire and they had a system of um, consulting neighbours to develop expertise about fire. And as I say, they used it to provide the habitats that various species needed. In other words, it was an ally. And uh, while we may not be able to recapture 1788, especially as our population increases, um, the thought that we could make fire at least a tool, because um, we don't have a totem system, is something we might strive towards. And 
I must say a lot of firefighters have, have agreed with me on that. They'd say we would like to burn more. Um, our problem is that the public objects to it. You know, it causes asthma and dirties the washing and whatever it may be. What about pastoralists? What do, what do farmers and other people on the land tell you? How do they respond to this book? It depends what they're, what they're uh, running. Uh, the northern cattlemen, uh, they use fire a lot anyway. As, as you can imagine, those uh, wet season grasses get up a couple of metres high sometimes and they burn those off to bring on the fresh growth. And I think they, they're receptive to more skillful um, uses of that because even there, in the long term, uh, the, uh, the grass can lose its richness, its lusciousness, so the soil gets worn out. I mean, ash is not all that good a fertiliser. In other places, uh, there's a, a lot of interest among farmers ab about maintaining good country. And when they see, as many of them got in touch with me and, and saw how their country was and how it is, they think, yes, we'd like to uh, get closer to replicating what... So were uh, they bringing you plans and survey maps Yes, and I got a... Uh, not long after the book came out, I got sent a beautifully drawn map, uh, several, mm, probably 70 or 80 centimetres wide, of a pastoral run in the 1840s, I think actually 1840, and it had all these uh, belts of trees, mainly grassy plain, belts of trees with little clearings in it. And the owner uh, sent me a copy of this and said, I've often wondered what those little clearings are because they're trees now, and now I see the sense of it. And uh, yeah, he's, he's going to sort of try and work to create something like it, not the same pattern, but something like uh, was in the old map. So is it in that period, up to say the 1840s and 50s, that you can most easily see the evidence of this? I'm wondering what happens when we look at, say, the Grass Dukes and, and Shepherd King's exhibition that's on here, which is slightly you know, in the second half, concentrating on the second half of the 19th century, are the, the traces still there? Well, it's a moving frontier, isn't it? When I say 1830, 1840, um, that's uh, sort of the inland plains just clear of the mountains. Um, in the north, you'd still be able to see a Aboriginal influence up to the Second World War. And in some places, of course, traditional expertise is, is pretty strong. There. So the frontier moves from Sydney in 1788 all the way through. As for the Darling Downs, uh, what's in this exhibition is a little late. What I'd like would be the, the first surveyors' maps before people actually settle or at the same time. But you draw, if you have a look at some of those drawings, there are vast swathes of eight open country, grassland, and the obvious question is that they could not have been cleared in the sh short 20 years that we're talking about, or even if they had been, then there'd be a lot of stumps there. So you can see in the paintings this grassland that must predate uh, the European arrival. Then you've got to go and check whether there's any other cause other than fire to do it. But uh, for people who live in the Darling Dance, I'm sure they could make a comparison between some of the drawings uh, that are there and what's there today and make their own conclusions about it. So Bill, what do you want this book and this argument to do? I mean, is it principally about reassessing our history, making us, it, us look at it again, or does it have implications for ongoing land practices? It has a lot of implications, I think, and, and they, they reach a long way from the book. I mean, population is one of them. One of the reasons Aboriginal people could do what they did is because they kept a, a control on the population. As our population grows, we're bound to get uh, more and more people into forest country or open forest country and that makes them vulnerable to fire and that's much more difficult. There are also questions about uh, water flows. The rivers now cut much deeper than they used to. Salination. But I think if I had to name them, I'd say there are three key things. The first is fire, 
just to prevent killer fires, to stop people being killed and property being destroyed by fires. We could learn from the Aborigines in fuel control. The second is uh, species protection, particularly in relation to fire. Uh, Australia has a very bad record when it comes to species extinction, uh, the worst in the world. Um, and that's saying something considering other parts of the world. And one of the reasons for that is the destruction of habitat. Fire can maintain habitats. As I say, it can provide the feed and shelter for a great range of both plants and animals, reptiles and so on. And the third is Aboriginal expertise. I mean, in a lot of places, Aborigines don't know very much at all. But they know a lot more than most of us. And more importantly, they're going to stay on country. They're going to stay there. Whereas our experts tend to do a project three years, 30 years, then move on. So um, valuing and using Aboriginal expertise, especially when we think how important local knowledge is in understanding country, the different trees, different plants, and different climate, and so on. Uh, that's, that's something we ought to do much more of. Well, I think that's a good opportunity then to hear questions or comments. And, um, and it will be also interesting, if you don't mind, identifying, I guess, your speaking position, whether you're an Aboriginal person or a scientist or a conservationist. I think there's lots and lots of different questions here. And, of course, we're awaiting the companion volume on the history of floods in Australia. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but if you wouldn't mind also waiting for the um, radio mics, just so that we can get, um, get it all on tape. Uh, so who would like to kick us off? And I have a light straight in my eye, so if I don't see you, please forgive me. Um, there's a question down the front here. Oh, hello, my name's Greg. Thanks very much for your presentation now and for your book. Um, I'm a bus driver, and so my interest is in street names and place names. And um, so I've been fascinated by the use of names, and, and so Girraween, for example, is a name we see around... Australia a lot. It's a place where flowers grow. It's an Aboriginal word. I'm wondering um, what important place names might we have? How do, how do these place names move around and are there any important place names that we see that might be associated with land management? And, and are they generic or, or, or communicated Indigenous words or are they a particular word from a particular culture? I'm sure there's, there's much more, many more descriptions of uh, land types and vegetation types in Aboriginal names than I know of. Um, the early surveyors, especially in Eastern Australia, not so much in the West, were instructed to use Aboriginal names where possible. And quite often, because they're asking about country, they really are asking questions which lead Aboriginal people to say what type of country it is. Uh, so it might be bald hill or grassy plain or something. Um, there's no single word, as I'm sure you know, there's at least 200 languages, or there was, across Australia, so you don't get one word for grassy plain or whatever it may be. On the other hand, uh, there's quite often a lot of miscommunication in names. I lived in New Guinea for a while, and the best example I can give is uh, um, from New Guinea, although I'm sure the same thing happened in Australia. And that was when two of the Highlands explorers, uh, Mick Lay and Jim Taylor, pointed out across the country and said, what do you call that? And they wrote down the answer. And many years later, they found that what they were told was, that's your finger. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a question just here. Hello. Uh, yeah, good day. I'm Andrew. Um, and I'll try and do the speaking position thing. I guess I'm just from Brisbane, but my family have got uh, roots, I guess, back into kind of the sort of grazier country in, in sort of southwestern Queensland. So your book dovetailed, I guess, with a, like a whole bunch of quite, how do you say, like disparate kind of experiences and, and things that had it resonated very deeply and made a lot of sort of fundamental sense. 
the question I wanted to ask, I guess, is just, you know, I guess there's a, a sort of a gathering kind of critical mass, I guess, of people who are, you know, who share this view of, of, of kind of an enhanced role of, of fire in landscape management in Australia. But one of the eye-openers in your book, I guess, was making a, a distinction I'd never even heard of between the idea of tributaries and distributaries in kind of in, in water flows. And that's something that seems to me, to, I mean, on the, the topic of floods, I guess, and runoff, you make the point in the book, I guess, that it potentially has really profound impacts um, on sort of on water retention in landscapes and really puts the, the focus away from building massive dams like Wyvernhoe and actually, you know, you go right back up to the top of the catchment and do all these different things that you outline to kind of in, increase the, you know, the water retention and delay the runoff. Mm. What, could you, I guess, comment on that, I guess, in terms of what its, its possibilities are for, for land management? What, what can be done now is, is, is not my expertise, I'm, I'm afraid. But uh, yes, yeah, so I describe in the book how the early uh, maps and descriptions uh, describe very shallow streams. I mentioned rivers earlier. In fact, it applies very largely to uh, creeks and rivers and all sorts of things, not only in the inland, but also on the coast. Um, and as you say, what were once distributaries, that is, water flowing from the uh, river out through a creek and into the plains and be providing water cover, uh, those same uh, watercourses are now tributaries because the river has cut deeper and therefore the water flows back. So the water's changed direction. Um, what can be done about that? I'm, I, I really... Uh, that's outside my expertise, or as an American friend of mine says, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually uh, wasn't but being I, entirely... But I recognise the problem. I wasn't being entirely facetious when I said I thought there was a companion volume on water, mm -hmm. because that is another really interesting part of the story, and you're also tracking that water, both visually and as it comes up in the, in the sources. Oh, absolutely. It's very important, uh, um, because what it did was create much, many more wetlands than Australia now has. Um, as you're inferring or saying that what happens is all the water now drains into the rivers and that creates the Wyvernhoe type problems that you're talking about. Um, whereas once it spread very widely, which didn't trouble Aboriginal people, although it might trouble us, so it could be a problem. Uh, but how, how you get the... Uh, rivers to become shallow again, I, I really don't know because our water flows are much faster, they cut much deeper and more qu quickly and so on. I think we may have lost that. Sorry, there's another question here and then I can see one here. Bill, my name's Neil Davidson. I, I'm a systems thinker so I see across many disciplines and what I love what you've done in this beautiful book uh, that I wish I'd written um, <laughs> and in the, the speech Shout that you've away. given. <laughs> Well, you've, ty you've typed it very neatly. Um, the, uh, what you've done is integrate so many different disciplines and makes so much sense. And I think in seeing you here now as, a, as an elder gentleman, if you don't mind me saying that, that slow knowledge that you bring and the understanding from a farmer's perspective of observing what works and the sort of things that Peter Andrews has done and the way that Indigenous cultures had deep connection with country and they weren't managing for mono-specific outcomes, whether it be wheat or cattle or sheep or... It was for everything, the whole system. The, the final line of your book, if I can just quote that back to you. Excuse me while I change vision. Um, we have a continent to learn. If we are to survive, let alone feel at home, we must begin to understand our country. If we succeed, one day we might become Australian. I think another purpose of your book, as a systems thinker who quoted it at the Woodford Folk Festival in a talk on systems thinking, is in bringing the sense of anticipatory systems design to a planet which has lost the capacity to understand how it's destroying itself. Mm. And so what you've done, I think, for me, as somebody who's trying to build documentary with an Indigenous man looking at the deep systems understanding that Indigenous people had mm. and where complex adaptive systems science is now telling us how many things we have to put back together again is show us a pathway where respect for the past and learning from what we already knew is as important as 
redefining what it is that we're trying to do. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a strange thing. We live in a country which we know is unique. We always talk about it being unique. Um, where fires destroy metropolitan suburbs with increasing regularity, where species are going extinct. I heard over the news recently that even some kangaroos are now under threat. And last year it was koalas. And all I like to say is if, if we can't look after such basic and fundamental things, I don't think we can call ourselves Australian. That's the first requirement of any society, surely, is to manage its own, uh, manage their own country. So, that's why the book finished where it did. And you stole my thunder. I was actually going to ask Bill to read that as, at the very end of the piece. <laughs> um, there's another question up here, one down here, here, and I can see you up the back, thank you. But I think there's somebody, oh, sorry, yeah, you're in the middle. Bill, um, thanks for that. It was elo eloquently put, I thought. On the, on the same topic of uh, species extinction, um, my interest is um, I've been a frequent volunteer at the Australian Wildlife Conservancy's property in the central Kimberley, the Mornington property, where they're very much involved in uh, mosaic burning. I just wonder, you haven't spoken in great detail about um, the impact of Aboriginal fire management practices on wildlife. Um, using Northern Australia as the example and the plight of uh, seed-eating birds across Northern Australia, I just wonder, could you uh, talk about that? I'm thinking of things like uh, the golden-shouldered parrot on Cape York mm. and um, the um, Gouldian finch right across uh, all of Northern Australia. Yeah. Um, when you mention particular examples like the golden child of parrot, uh, uh, it's, the, it's a debate as to why it's become extinct or, or nearly, depending on who you believe. Um, and some of the explanations are changes to habitat, in other words, changes to what Aborigines are doing, and some of them are the introduction of feral animals. Uh, cats or foxes or so on, depending on the species. Uh, and, and the feral introductions are a big problem, both the animals and the weeds and, and the camphor laurels and whatever it may be. Uh, but there still is this large group of, uh, of species which can be uh, assisted by restoring their habitat. And they're the ones that the Wildlife Conservancy is working on. Tim Flannery's quarterly essay gives some other examples as, as well. And it's one of those areas where I think uh, we could learn from Aboriginal people. Because to talk about the whole of Northern Australia is one thing, but to get a local expert who knows that down that creek there is a colony of a particular species and that if you do this, that species will flourish or at least it won't become extinct. That's the kind of application that I think is, is most valuable, that local knowledge, and that means Aboriginal expertise and farmers and so on, on whose land that, that uh, colony may be. And in other words, you've got to go very local and, and use that knowledge. Mm. And there's a, another man here. Darling Downs and dug diprotodon's bones out of the creek beds and so I have an understanding of, of some of the land issues there I feel but my, I've often wondered how long has this been going on? How long? How many millennia? How many tens of thousands of years have the Aborigines been managing the land as intensely as you describe? Do you have a sense of that? Well, there's two things. Uh, Obviously, water flows have changed a lot uh, during Aboriginal occupation. Now, perhaps people know about the false banks. Uh, most uh, rivers and creeks in Australia, if I can uh, graph what happens, you have a level land and then it dips down and then you go across what we call the flats. 
and then you go dip down again into the water course and similarly up the other side across the flats and up. Those first, that first dip down off the level of the country is called the false bank, nicknamed the false bank if you like, and that's where the river or the creek used to be 3,000 years ago under, under a much heavier rainfall and so on. And clearly Aboriginal people were, um, were operating their system uh, while that was going on. How expertly, I don't know. Clearly, like any other people, I assume they went through a learning curve. When they reached the level of expertise they had when Europeans interrupted it, I can't say. All I can say is that from various clues, it's clear that they've been doing the sort of thing they were doing in 1788 for the last uh, six or seven hundred years at least, because the nature of, of big old trees and forests but how far back before that, I don't know. My guess is, and again, this is not letting the truth get in the way, my guess is for a considerable time, but I'm sure they were refining their expertise. There's somebody waiting here. Thank you. Um, primary school teacher, currently engaging with journalism a bit. Um, a beautiful book. Um, the writing is so beautiful. I just really wanted to make that point that the writing is so beautiful. You pick the book up anywhere and the beauty of the writing really speaks to you quite apart from the, the underlying excitement and challenge and beauty of the book and I just really wanted to say that. Um, you, this book's 50 years in the making, um, by my calculation, 40 years of you know, doing a new parent when you went to, invited to places, you went out and cast your eye over the land and mm. determined what you could from the land and added to your knowledge base of it um, and then you retired and then you spent 10 years or so writing, actually writing the book. Is that, that roughly right? Yeah, that's a good Did point. no one ever invite you to Bunjalung land? There are no Clarence River, no Richmond River, no Nimbin, no Casino, no Kyogle, one mention of Cape Byron. Uh, it, did that not happen? No, it didn't happen. Um, and there are plenty of people all over Australia who could ask the same question. Mm. Uh, I should say I cut 100,000 words out of, my, out of the book because <laughs> I, thought, I thought no one would publish it. <laughs> I was lucky it was published as it was. Um, but yeah, the, I also think that if there isn't a lot of evidence, an enormous amount of evidence that I haven't used, then my thesis doesn't stand up. It's got to be able to apply far beyond what I say. And so you can do that for Bunjalong country. <laughs> <laughs> the Bureau of Meteorology has uh, a section on um, the meteorolog meteorological knowledge of the, the northern people and the general people. It would be, and, and you're talking about Aboriginal expertise, I think it's really time we started talking about Aboriginal botany and Aboriginal geology and bring in and speak of it as science because that is indeed what it was and I think that's what your book shows really powerfully. Mm. And I know there's another question here but this man's been waiting and I think there was somebody, sorry, there is somebody right up the back. Um, well, my question is to do with uh, Aboriginal population. I've long been intrigued that uh, after several tens of thousands of years of occupation uh, their, their, their numbers were, were really quite low. Was it a deliberate, did they deliberately uh, control their numbers? And if so, how did they do it? And what was their, their reasoning? Were they, was it a conscious decision, a del deliberate decision? And if so, why? What, what was the problem of their, their concern with their numbers? There are some parts of that question nobody will ever get the answer to now, even uh, Aboriginal people who have more complete genealogies of their ancestors than anyone else. Um, and they can tell you about numbers, of course. Um, it's just beyond our knowledge, but I suspect, as I say in the book, that what Aboriginal people were doing was regulating their population to what I call a hundred year drought. In other words, to the really tough times. They made sure their numbers could survive those times without great stress. How did they do that? Well, there's all sorts of ways. Um, uh, 
old marrying young is a, was a common thing. Uh, that's old men marrying young women, old women marrying young men. Uh, infanticide, um, uh, abortions, uh, late marriage age, uh, restricted opportunities, the uh, ceremonial interchanges where marriages could take place depended on build up of food supplies and depended on the country. They might be every year, it might be every three years. And so it's it's a deliberate Deli I think it was a deliberate policy, yeah. yeah. Now the woman at the back has been waiting. I'm sorry I missed you last time. Yes, I actually really was wanting to ask about population two, because you did mention population and I've got my Sustainable Population Australia hat on. Um, would you mind turning it round the other way now and maybe looking forward at now and our land practices and the people, the number of people we've now got in the country and our rapid population growth rates and reflect forward with the, with the vision of home, home, with your understanding looking back? Well, uh, I think uh, what I think about population doesn't necessarily relate to 1788. Uh, we're not going to replicate that aspect of Aboriginal society. Um, but just independently of, of 1788, it seems to me that uh, you've got a finite lot of resources in Australia, admittedly plenty of them, and population growth is infinite. And no matter how many delaying factors you have, sooner or later, the, uh, the population is going to e exceed the resource supply. And uh, that's going to be a problem. Now, if you think short term, the next 100 years or so, that's short term, um, that might be a problem you worry about. But if you think long term, Aboriginal lengths of time, then it is a problem. It's a big problem. And we might have just one more question, I think. Thanks, Bill. My name's Nicola. Um, I found your book quite challenging, and um, I'm sure some people have found it quite heretical. Um, one of the things that made me think about was national parks. Um, what is the role of a national park, and how should we be managing them? Well, there's a couple of roles of, for national parks, isn't there? There's one where they're conservation areas to protect uh, a species or species. Uh, there are some that are recreation areas. The, the very first national park in Australia, the Royal National Park, the second national park in the world, by the way, um, was a recreation park. It had a rifle range and tennis courts and uh, things Don't like that. Don't mention the rifle range. <laughs> That's how it was, <laughs> and so on. But, but now I think we think of national parks in two, two senses, recreation certainly, conservation of species. But I also suspect that a uh, country that nobody else wants to use, except possibly Aborigines, has made a national park. In other words, it's a place where we can put land that nobody particularly wants, unless, of course, we find something mineral, then we can revoke the national park or go underneath it and, and so on. The problem with national parks is not so much as why they're formed, but how they're run. They don't get enough uh, resources to look after them properly. Uh, what I'm saying about national parks being left to run wild is something that a lot of uh, national parks managers, especially those on the ground, would agree with. I know they would agree with it. I've spoken to them about it. So ending on the, the tricky question about what, um, what return or a idea of a pristine landscape means. Um, now, as I said, I, I, I was building up to a dramatic conclusion where I handed over the book and said, read us the last line, but it's already happened. Um, and we will be hearing again from, from Susan from the State Library. But um, could you please all join me first in thanking Bill Gamage. Thanks,
Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Bill, for, for sharing such a, a fascinating aspect of our past with us here tonight. Uh, if anybody would like to revisit this talk, please feel free to come back to the State Library website in a few days. We'll have the recording in full there for you. And also, if you can, do take the time to visit uh, Grass Dukes and Shepherd Kings in the Philip Bacon Heritage Gallery. It's open every day from 10 until 5. Thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you again here soon at the State Library.